good to follow some some singing like that. It was like a preparation. Well, I probably don't have to say this, but I will. This is this is not one of those texts that you glory in. This is one of those texts that you're warned by. It has been, as you probably know, this has been like a, a battleground text for generations. Uh, people arguing about what this means and what it doesn't mean. I, I desire for the truth itself the Word of God itself to have more impact on me than what men say about it. There's a lot of religious activity today which really amounts to not much more than people arguing about what people have said. Then really, I mean you know how stories and rumors uh, get going about well they said this and then you end up with 10 or 12 different versions and different generations of what somebody thought that somebody else said. And that can be said about the scriptures, is that there's a, lot, there's a lot of words running around today that really they're things that somebody said about what God said. It's not what God said at all. There are other texts of scripture like this that have the, this, uh, this quality of being like a, like a hammer. That's what Jerem- the Lord said through Jeremiah. My word is like a hammer. I'm thankful that... His, his word is not only like a hammer. Just imagine if every word of God was like a hammer. Well, it's not. See, he has, he has very sweet words as well. Very, very pleasant words. He, ha, he has comfortable words. Uh, he, uh, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Jeremiah ate his words and they were the joy and rejoicing of his heart. But see, the word of God is very, it's very diverse. It's like people have made allusions to the word of God being like a garden where there's all kinds of things, all kinds of things growing, and some, some things that you bring out of the garden, you can eat straight out of the garden. Some things you don't. Some things require some preparation. Some things out of the garden you can eat in large quantities, and they're, and they're great, but some of them you use in very small quantities. See, that, so the Word of God is like, we don't want to be preaching Hebrews 6.6 6 every week, yeah, right. but we do want to preach Hebrews 6.6 6 right. because it's in there. It's impossible to renew them again unto repentance. You want, you want, your, you want your, your conscience, your soul, uh, to, be, uh, to be tempered by words like this. God did say this. Amen. You don't want to shy away from it because of what somebody else has said about it. You know, there are people that will shy away from a text because it sounds like it might be a Baptist text. Yeah. Where in the world did that come from? I didn't, I didn't know that there were some texts that were full gospel and some texts that weren't. And some texts that were Baptist texts and some texts that weren't Baptist texts. It sounds like that an enemy have been, has been sowing a lot of bad seed. And so now you have a, you have a field of diverse seeds all growing up. And now the, the Lord said, no, let them, both, let them all grow together for the time. And it looks confusing. And it, cause, it, it can cause a lot of... Uh, a lot of, lot of wondering. But the fact is that all these things e- exist in the world. And the Lord, the Lord, just remember the Lord said, My sheep know my voice. They hear my voice and a stranger, they, they won't follow. So you don't want to just spin, spin your wheels trying to figure out exactly what every, everyone means by everything they say. You want to... You wanna, um, you want to be plowing and exercising yourself to hear the voice of the shepherd. And then that voice will distinguish all the other voices, all the voices of the strangers and the hirelings and, and things that have, that have no care for your soul. There are other texts of Scripture like, uh, that have this weight of a hammer. Like judgment must be, it's time that judgment begin at the house of God. Now. If it begins at us now, what shall be the end be of them that obey not the gospel? Of God, there's other texts like like this in the book of Hebrews. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Our God is a consuming fire, and if that see that those words like that are meant to are are meant to jar you, and 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 catch your catch your attention and make you, um, like Brother Fred used to say, they'll stab you awake. It has that quality about it. How about? Uh, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, judgment. 
See, the world, the world pushes the fact of death. It, it makes, makes a lot of effort to push the reality of death as far away from them as they can. And they're, they're not even, they don't even try to hide the fact. There's a, uh, people say, you know, how are you doing today? Well, at least I'm on the right side of the grass. They, because they don't, they, they push it. They want it to be as far away from them as, as they possibly can. But the fact remains, this is, like, this, is like a, this is like a banner that the Lord has given us to display. It is appointed unto man once to die. Just imagine if this ran on the front of Time magazine. Yeah. You know, Time, they, they kind of pride themselves in, in having these jarring cover stories to get people's attention. But they, they probably wouldn't run that. Yeah. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, face judgment. But that would get people's attention if it was, see, if it was displayed. But we've, we, have, um, we have maybe a, a famine of hearing the word of God. Well, the father, the father of lies is the enemy of our soul. Yeah. That, that's something that should make you, uh, make you vigilant in your, your time upon, upon the earth. As long as you're in the body, the enemy of your soul is the father of lies. That, that tells us, that indicates to us what type of battle that we're in. There are, all, there are all kinds of enemies. And the scripture tells us that flesh and, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We, we, cannot, we cannot touch the enemy. And if you, if you fight as if flesh and blood was your enemy, then you're, you're fighting wrong. You're not, you're not fighting the, the good fight. The father of lies is the enemy of our souls. So here's, a, here's an example of the, of the tactics, the, uh, the, uh, the devices of, of the enemy, is that he gives birth to imaginations. The father of lies. Imagination is another, another way of saying saying lies. There's no, there's no reality be, behind or under what is being represented. It's a lie. It's an imagination. This imagination he has uh, propagated in the world, he's given birth to it. Is it he's the, the, see, a father is a father because he, he's given birth. He has, he's a progenitor. And so this father of lies has given birth to this idea that repentance is a simple decision that lies within the power of all sinners and at all times. And that's a lie. Amen. That's right. He is, after all, a devourer. He's a lion prowling about, seeking whom he may devour. Yeah. And he devours with lies. Yeah. Amen. See, this is one of the dangers of, being, of living in a sleepy, dozy generation. Right. Is that not, to not even realize that lies are your enemies. Yeah. And lies can devour you. Amen. What do you think Paul meant when he said, let no man spoil you? He wasn't, he wasn't talking about a, a man in a mask breaking in your back door. No. That, that's not... What we, you do want to have the kind of faith that can rejoice at the spoiling of your goods. You, knowing that you have in heaven a better and enduring substance. You do want to be able to do that. But the, a, a masked man breaking in your back door is, is nothing compared to a man that will spoil you. Yeah, that's right. And he spoils with lies. He spoils with imagination. So the devouring lion, he, devoured, he doesn't devour with claws and teeth. He devours with lies and imaginations. Amen. He did come to kill and to rob and to destroy. And again, he does it with lies. He's the father of lies. We are told in Ephesians chapter 6 to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word's not used a lot, but it's a good word. Yeah, well, wiles. That's right. So it, 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 it describes this, this aggressiveness. of he come, He's come down into earth full of wrath, knowing that he hath but a short time. So he's, a, he, he's, he's working against men with, with wiles. It's just what it, it, in other words, like he's pulling out all the stops. He just, whatever it takes, just, just like a flood. He spews out a flood to take the woman. The wiles of the devil. The devil doesn't disclose the full terms of compliance to his subjects. That is, that's part of him being the father of lies, is that he, he, he lures, he, he disguises, he masquerades as an, as an angel of light. He, here's something that, see, the Lord had to, the Lord actually, like behind his back, the Lord discloses what the devil doesn't. 
So he's telling all of his, all of his foibles, but the devil himself doesn't. So the devil doesn't tell you that. Now remember with this temptation that he who commits sin is the servant of sin. Satan will never tell you that. Yes, amen. He never does say, now remember, before you yield to this temptation that I'm, I'm offering you, just remember that he, to whom you yield yourselves to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. So if you yield to this, I've got you. He'll never tell you that. But his servants you are to whom you obey. He never does tell anybody that he takes, cap, he takes people captive at his will. The Lord, he revealed that from heaven. So the, the devil's in the business of covering stuff up, and God's in the business of revealing things. And he reveals, see, that's what Paul said, what a glorious word it is. He said, we are not ignorant of his devices. He's been, he's been exposed. We're living in the day of, of revelation. The true light now shines. It shines on us so we can see ourselves for what we really are. We find, as we're coming, as we're coming to Christ, we find that we find our, our sinner status, our need for grace, our need for forgiveness. We must be born again. But that light also shows us our enemy. Amen. The father of lies. <clears throat> now, if, if repentance as, and recovery is really up to the discretion of man, then a Savior is not what man needed. If repentance was just a matter of decision, and a lot, it, it's astounding to me how many people think that this is, this is the case. That, uh, and I, I don't mean just doctrinal wrangling. It happens there too. I mean, I'm talking about people, how they think in their own minds. Practically speaking, people never do think that if I, if I enter into this, I might not be able to come out. People will dabble with stuff because they think that they can stop when they want to. That's why they dabble. And that's why, see, the, the devil doesn't start with the big things. He says, hey, see, isn't it good, isn't it pleasing to the eye? See, he starts with things like that just to get your attention diverted. And what, see, dialogue with the devil is never a good thing. We're told to resist him, not argue with him. There's the, he's the, this, how, can it, how can it end up? Arguing with the father of lies. You know, you, don't, you just don't argue with a man who just, he's just a liar. We have, we have uh, medical terms for that. People they just lie all the time, lie so much that they don't even know they're lying. It, there, there's no point in having a conversation. But they, they, they deceive themselves, and it's their intention to, to deceive you also. So we resist him steadfast in the faith. We don't reason with him. And Eve, he, she allowed some reasoning. She looked at, she took his suggestion and thought, well, yeah, it is. It does look good. Maybe it didn't look any different than the other ones. It was just the place where that tree was. The Lord said, those trees don't, I don't know. Maybe, you know, the, the Lord's very discreet in how he represents things. So he didn't tell us what Jesus looked like. And I think there's wisdom in that. Mm -hmm. The Lord didn't tell us very many details about the forbidden tree. That would have been the, the subject of volumes of people writing and and dabbling in that kind of thing. He didn't tell us what it, it may have looked just like the other trees or it may have looked very different. I don't know. But the point was that Eve started down the slippery slope of temptation when she, when she entertained his suggestion. Yep. Amen. Repentance and recovery is not within, it's not perpetually with, within the grasp of, of man's decision, of man's, um, of man's ability and, and if it, see, the, the fact that God sent us a Savior tells us a lot about our condition. Mm -hmm. yeah. It means we were lost. The fact that He sent us a Redeemer means that we, we had a debt. So we had to be redeemed. See, a Redeemer, a, a, a Savior who comes to redeem, tells us that there was a redemption, a redemption price that had to be paid. So what the Lord gave, in, in itself, what the Lord gave, it itself is defining the condition that we find ourselves in. So he sent us a Savior, and it seem, doesn't it seem simple for me to say this? He sent us a Savior because we needed saved. Amen. It, it does seem simple, but it's profound. The, long, the, the further you let it sink down into your ears, if I needed saved, then that means I couldn't do it. If I needed saved, then it was, it was worse. My condition was worse than I thought. That's what conviction is all about. 
Man, we, we aren't born into a, a, a precise knowledge and an awareness of our condition. We had, to be, we had to see a great light. We had to be convicted. We had to be broke down by the mercy of God, by the goodness of God, before we even knew our condition. Like the, one of the br Brother Keys used to say, he says, you don't get any good news until you get the bad news. Because good news isn't good unless you have the bad. And that's what the law, that was the ministration of the law. You got to have Moses to really make you, to, to, to beat you down into the, 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 the pit that you're really in. Now, technically speaking, Moses didn't beat us down into a pit. Moses revealed the pit we were already in. And then when grace comes along, see, grace has a good sound when you know you're in a pit. But if you don't, if you don't know there, if you don't know the condition that you're in, see, the gospel really has, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't have much, it kind of misses me. The gospel, the gospel must be talking about somebody else because it's talking about some of those, some of those bad people. See, if, I, if I've missed, if the light hasn't shown in my heart to give, to give that, that knowledge. So if repentance and recovery is within my ability and my discretion, then I probably just need some, just some more information. I probably just need some, some instruction and things will be... Uh, we'll just click right along in, in, the, in the right direction. Well, Acts 17, uh, Paul uh, was on, on uh, Mars Hill, and he was addressing uh, some people who just love to tell and hear something new. That sounds kind of uh, rather, rather contemporary, doesn't it? We just want to hear something new. Not, not the old stuff. We kind of like just, uh, just trinkets, you know, and something new just to kind of, that's tickling ears. That's what that is. That's itching ears. And so Paul observed that there was all kinds of monuments to God, the God of this and the God of that and the God of him and the God of her, and there's just monuments everywhere to every God, and one is like Brother Gibbon said a long time ago, I always remember, they made one to an unknown God just in case they missed one. And so Paul, being the God-conscious man that he was, he said, this is the God that I've come to declare unto you. And by the way, he's commanded everywhere, every man, everywhere to repent. Amen. And you should turn from this. From all these other all these other gods. So in the in ge in the general terms, when we're speaking of the world, like John three sixteen says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. So in that respect, in the world, in regards to the world, He commands the world to repent. In other words, everyone born of Adam has the responsibility to repent because they've sinned. That's not what Hebrews six is talking about. There's a difference between. Repentance in Acts 17 and repentance in Hebrews 6. Because Hebrews 6, he's talking about a repentance that's impossible. Yeah. So there's obviously some difference that we have to unpack. Now if God has commanded every man to repent, then obviously God has laid some burden of responsibility on mankind. Mm -hmm. Because a commandment is a stewardship. It's a God has required this. And now it's, it's, it's up to man to pick this up and to, to take it and to go forward with it. But in terms of Hebrews 6, the, the Holy Spirit is addressing a condition in Hebrews 6 that I call a second repentance. Acts 17 is about a first repentance. Hebrews 6 is not. Hebrews 6 is talking about people who did repent. And now they need to repent again. The second repentance is not like the first. Remember when Jesus, uh, addressed, he wrote the letter to the Laodiceans, he didn't just say the same thing to all seven churches because there was different, there were different conditions that had to be addressed. So he said to the Laodicea, come by of me. Well, what about, what about Isaiah uh, 55? Come by, buy without money. Freely you've received, freely give. What about that? He says to Laodicea, come by of me. Why? Because they were a church that forgot Jesus. And coming the second time is not like coming the first time. That's right. There's a state of man that is worse than the first state. Amen. The first state of man is bad enough. We've all, all, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's the first state. Everybody has sinned. We were, if, if Christ was sent to die for all, then we're all dead. That's the first state. But there's a, there's a last state that, that will be, that's worse than the first. That's being recovered from the first state. And then after your recovery, 
going back to the first state. It's, it's like the, the, the man that seven demons came back, not just one. It's possible to reach such a state that it would have been better to have never known the way of righteousness than to having known it and to turn back. Again, Jesus talked about it would, it would be better for a, that a millstone be hung about a man's neck and he'd be thrown into the sea. That'd be better than to offend one of these little ones. Amen. The conscience of man can be seared as with a hot iron. That's one of those last states is worse than the first. The, the conscience of man, the soul of man, that the uh, image of God that's in man has already been damaged by sin. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. But then for it to be seared as with a hot iron. That's a, medically today we'd say cauterized. Is that it's just, it's, it's damaged to the point where it doesn't, there, there's, no, there's no feeling uh, anymore in it. Men can become so insensitive and so hard that God would say, as He did to Jeremiah, don't pray for this people. Yeah. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ said that. Don't pray for this people. Yeah. Amen. Now, it's not our intention to try to define and find people that are in that condition. It's our intention. It has to be our motivation to make sure that that's never said of us. Yeah. That's right. Because God, now, I the Lord change not. Does, it, does anyone, I don't think anyone in their right mind would, would uh, argue that point. And say, God said, I the Lord change not. No, no one stands up and says, no, I, I disagree with that. But there are people who embrace doctrines that, that actually imply that God has changed. Yeah, okay. Past feeling is a phrase that Paul used. I, I, I refer to this a lot, but I... The, it, it keeps it keeps coming coming back to me. Who having uh, who being past feeling, Paul said. In other words, God can God could shout out of heaven and you wouldn't know it, or God could bless you and you wouldn't know it. God could open the door of repentance to you and you wouldn't know it. That's being past feeling. <clears throat> Noah's generation. Uh, stands as a testimony to us that the Lord can say, that's enough. Yeah. To a whole generation. Sodom and Gomorrah stand as an example that, that God can say, that's enough of the cities. And, the, and all the plains, of the, the cities of the plain too. It wasn't just like, you know, within the city limits. I don't know if they had city limits back then or not. But they had walls, the city walls. But it was also the, the, the cities of the whole plain where God said, that's enough. He reached, he reached his limit. That's enough. Caleb's generation, Joshua and Caleb, the Lord said, that's enough. You're not entering in. He says, All, your little ones will, but you're not going to enter in. God, he just, he, the people pushed him to a point. It's not that God's an austere man. Some people have concluded that God's an austere man, but he's not. That's right. Amen. That's right. But when people... When people push him to the point that Sodom and Gomorrah did, then he says that's enough. But that it wasn't before a lot of a lot of patience, and it wasn't before a lot of 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 mercy. Repentance is such is such a an obstacle. Repentance is such a hurdle that God had to exalt to His right hand Him to be Prince and a Savior to give repentance. So how about? What, what, what about this that people think that re I can repent any time? If, I can re if repentance was left up to my discretion, then Jesus didn't have to be exalted to give repentance. But God exalted Jesus to give repentance, which tells me that repentance is not such a simple matter as I thought. If there has to be an exalted Savior to give repentance. See, there are some things that are just beyond the reach of common people. There, there, there are things... In, in this world, that they're just, they're unfamiliar to me, they're outside of my comprehension, they're outside of my experience, but the people in exalted places, they, they're, they're only accessible to them. And I, I, can't, I can't access them, I can't, I can't reach them. Jesus had to be exalted to, to give repentance. So what, what really did happen at uh, the, day, the day of Pentecost, when 3,000 repented. Peter saw it. He has shed forth this which you, which you see and hear. It really, it really wasn't the, uh, 
uh, the psychological nuances of Peter's message, that he really tugged on their, you know, it was Jesus gave repentance. Amen. He poured out repentance. What about Lydia? The Lord opened her heart to attend unto the things, and she constrained the apostles to come. And what, what happened to Lydia? The Lord gave her repentance. He, she was granted repentance. If, if it takes an exalted Savior to give it, then may no man ascribe it to the decision of men. God exalted Christ to give repentance. And only he can give it. Uh, Acts 11, verse 18. This is the, uh, you know, Peter got in trouble for going to Cornelius' house. This is another thing that happens today, isn't it? You, you, went, you went to their church kind of thing. Well, that's what happened in Jerusalem. When Peter, when, it, when the word got out, the Jews said, you went to his house? And so Peter just, he rehearsed what happened. And the Jews said, well, then God's are granted repentance. He's granted repentance to the Gentiles. As he, did, as he did to the Jews. No one said, well, the worship team must have been very effective that morning. God granted repentance to the Gentiles. No one said, Peter, you need to start a seminary so that we can all preach like you do. God, God granted repentance. That's what happened. When people repent, it's evidence that God granted repentance. That's, right. That's what happens. So repentance is a, it's a gift of God. <clears throat> repentance is also we could say it's, a stu it's the stewardship of Jesus repentance belongs to him he's been, he's been exalted to give it Revelation chapter 2 verse 21 he says that I, I gave her space to repent the woman who, who taught um, and put stumbling blocks in front of the people and taught them to commit fornication Jesus says I gave, I gave her space to repent he gave her an allotted Time. That's space. Not that means it wasn't going it wasn't always available because he gave it. And it also means it's not always going to be available because it's a space. I gave her a space to repent. It was an opportunity that allowed for repentance. And what what could this what could this have been? It had to have been uh, perceivable to this woman because Jesus gave it. Jesus gave it to her. So what, what would this have been? Well, think back through your life about the, the, the first time you repented. There was something that called you to repentance. Jesus said, I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He called you to repentance. There was some word mm -hmm. given. There was some insight open to you that called you to repentance. And you, you saw it. It was... It was obvious that the, the Lord had given, he had given you a space to repent. He'd opened the door of repentance to you, and you were able to ent enter into it. So somehow this woman, she knew, she sensed, because God is just, she sensed that there was an opportunity for her to be recovered from this. Because God gave her, Jesus gave her space to, to repent, and she, she repented not. Romans 2.4 says that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like that. that we, we come to God, we came to God because we saw that He's good. Yeah. See, it, it might be, it, it's kind of a lower, a lower view to um, want to go to heaven because you don't want to go to hell. Yeah. But there's a more excellent way. Amen. Then the, uh, the goodness of God has... has it leads people uh, to, re to repent. Paul addressed the, uh, the church at Corinth about a... There, there was a lot going on in Corinth. You know, there was a, this was just like a... This was almost like a circus, just something going on in every ring there at Corinth. And he said in 2 Corinthians 7, he said, I, I rejoice that you were made sorry. Not, not, that, not that you were just sorrowful, he said, but that you sorrowed to repentance. He wrote in order to shame them. They were going to court. They were suing each other. They were in the assembly. Some of them had way too much to eat and other of them were starving all at the Lord's table. And he wrote to them to shame them. And he said, I, I rejoice that you, that you sorrowed. Uh, for you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Well, isn't uh, sorrow, isn't it um, like the first stages of repentance? 
the, that re regret, that sorrow yes. of I've done this and I can't change it. Mm -hmm. I can't take it away now. I can't, yeah. I can't undo it. Mm -hmm. They sorrowed to repentance. See, that, see it's good to be able to, uh, to be familiar enough. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And as it dwells richly then, see, you'll, you'll be able to uh, identify, to define things in your own walk uh, with, with the Scriptures themselves. Brother Al said it this way, it's a good, it's a good thing to find yourself in the Scriptures. And that, that's, a, that's a blessed experience. So, and and I found myself there with, with Corinth, that I sorrowed unto repentance. It was a, a, a godly sorrow. That, um, you know, failure in the world might drive you away from someone, but, but so, godly sorrow will drive you to the one, to the God that you sinned against. That, that's, a, that's a blessed... And see, no one, no one in that sorrow, in that condition of returning to God out of godly sorrow and repentance, no one comes and says, I've repented because I decided to. Amen. Repentance was given to them. There was a, and the goodness of God led them, led them to repentance. Now Esau is another issue that has to be has to be dealt with in Hebrews twelve seventeen. He says, "Ye know that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, after he he uh, he sold the birthright, he gave up the the uh, uh, his what was rightfully his. He was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So tears are not always genuine." He sought it carefully with tears. It, it amazes me how often tears and crying are presented in the religious world as undeniable proof and undeniable evidence that someone is sincere. Well, Esau cried, but he was, he was rejected. He found no place of repentance. Repentance was just out of his reach. So he was, he, there was something motivating his crying, but it wasn't a godly sorrow. No... He found no place for, for repentance. We should all be, all be warned. See, at the time, when it really was his, he's de he despised it. Yeah. Amen. When it did, the blessing belonged to him, when the birthright belonged to him, then he, he despised it. He, he rejected it, and that, that calloused him mm -hmm. to a point where he found no place. Found no place for repentance. Luke chapter 16 is the occasion where Jesus uh, talked about Lazarus dying and uh, being carried, escorted to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man dying and, and going to hell. And then there was some dialogue between the rich man and, and Abraham about send, uh, send somebody to my... Send Lazarus, he said. He suggested... That's amazing, the boldness. From, from torment, from the place of torment, suggesting that, the, that Lazarus go back and warn and warn his brothers, and there in this dialogue ensued. You remember that what I wanted to to extract from that is that uh, the rich man said in torment, he says, "No, but if if somebody returned from the dead, then my brothers will listen. Yeah. They'll repent." Yeah. And Abraham said, "If they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, then they won't listen to a man that rose from the dead either." That's right. Amen. Amen. That's right. This tells us how how potent the hardness of sin is. Yes. Amen. That the, what Moses has said, you want to get this, that the, the testimony of Moses, or what Abraham said, mm -hmm. the testimony of Moses and the law and the prophets mm -hmm. is just as powerful and potent and effective as a bodily resurrection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. And if they don't believe Moses... They won't believe a man that was risen from what was raised from the dead. They won't repent it either. This tells us, see, <clears throat> I brought that into the, the mix here because the Holy Spirit's talking about a condition where it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. See, something can only be renewed so many times. And there's a condition then that it just it can't like Jeremiah's garment that was buried by the river. It was good, it was good for nothing. It was impossible to renew them again to repentance. And it could be said of those brothers that a man risen from the dead that testifies to them wouldn't do any good. Mm -hmm. We should all be admonished by these things. <clears throat> Miracles, this is, a, this is a, a, a common approach at things as well. Miracles are not repentance producing. 
this, who, who I believe that Jesus and Moses were the most prodigious miracle workers the world has ever seen. And Moses didn't have a whole lot of, of converts <laughs> resulting from his miracles. And Jesus didn't have converts from his miracles. He had converts from the preaching of his apostles. Natural disaster, personal tragedy, calamity and danger all around. It's a common deception for people to think, if this happens to that person, then, it, then that will bring them to Christ. That will bring them to the Lord. I think that's a, that's, there's an element of truth to that. Maybe... Maybe a natural disaster could make people think about uh, righteousness and, and judgment to come. But the disaster itself is not repentance producing. The exalted Savior at the right hand of God has to give, has to give that repentance. So tragedy and disaster and calamity, they may, they may prepare somebody, like John the Baptist prepared some, they, he prepared the way for the Lord. The disaster may prepare somebody, but unless the Lord gives repentance, then we've seen it before. Things resume. They go back to the way they were before the calamity came. Now there's a word uh, given here <clears throat> that is uh, that is jarring. Seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. There's not, you know, there's, a, there's text in the Scripture about hope that you can go and, ref, like, the hope maketh not ashamed. But you can go to all kinds of other areas of Scripture and, and learn that hope is an anchor of the soul. And see, and that sheds light on, on this, other, this other text. There's a lot of text, the hope, he that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as 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 he is he is pure. See, there's a lot of a lot of texts on on hope that comment all on each other. There's not a lot of texts that comment on he cruci they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. This is this is one of those perhaps unique. I don't know if it's completely unique in the Scripture, but it's there's not a whole lot of texts like this that warn people about crucifying to themselves the Son of God afresh. Just, he says it very carefully. He doesn't say, they crucify Jesus. No, Jesus was only, already crucified, and it was only one time. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 7.27 says that he, this he did once when he offered himself. That's right. So if someone returns back to the world, they're not literally crucifying Jesus again. They're crucifying him to themselves. Mm -hmm. yes. Amen. But not literally. Hebrews 9.26 says, This he did once at the end of the world when he offered up himself. So he's, Jesus, you don't, you don't want to be confused about this. Jesus is only crucified one time. Amen. Romans 6.10 says, He died unto sin once. There's several places in Scripture. 1 Peter 3.18, He once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. So Jesus isn't dying again every time mm -hmm. someone falls again. He's not suffering again every time someone, someone falls again. But he, they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. Here's one, one word that Paul gave, uh, I think can help in this regard, just for the use of crucify. He, the word crucify, they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. What do you or who do you crucify? Someone who has no use. That's why the Jews crucified him, right? There's Amen. doing away with him. We, we, will have, we will not have this man to reign over us. They said, by our law, he ought to die because he, being a man, makes himself God. So they crucified him because they were done with him. They wanted nothing more to do with him. And the same use of the word, Paul said, I am crucified unto the world. Yeah. Yeah. The world had no use for him. And he went on to say, and the world unto me. So Paul was saying, kind of tongue-in-cheek, it's mutual. That's right. The world has no use for me, and I have no use for it. And so there's a mutual crucifixion. We've canceled each other out. Yeah. Uh -huh. We've rejected each other. Uh -huh. So now think about that in light of, he crucified to himself uh -huh. the Son of God afresh. They crucified to themselves yeah. the Son of God afresh. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Here's another view Another view of this, crucified to themselves. Think about the, the, the personal pronoun used there, them, to themselves. Jesus wasn't crucified to me. He was crucified to God. 
He was offered to... Hebrews 9.14 says he offered himself without spot to God. He is the Lamb of God, not the Lamb of Aaron. He offered... He poured out his blood in heaven, not in earth. There are people who say that the ransom for mankind, Jesus paid it to the devil. That's a... It's just a lie. He, God was the one offended. David said, against thee and thee only have I sinned. We haven't sinned against the devil. We've sinned against God. So when Jesus offered himself, he offered himself without spot to God. God received the payment. He received the, the redemption. Ephesians 5.2 says he's given himself an offering and a sacrifice to God as a sweet, uh, for a sweet smelling savor. But here in this text... It's almost like the Holy Spirit is speaking tongue in cheek. He cruci- they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. But when, when, the, when the real crucifixion took place, he had offered himself to God. He prayed, uh, Lord, receive um, unto thy hands I commit my spirit. He offered himself uh, to God. I want to read some text in, uh, from Hebrews chapter 10 uh, because the Holy Spirit comes over uh, this, this matter again in chapter 10, verse 18, he says, where remission of these is, there's no more offering for sin. Mm -hmm. He died once, offered himself to God. He he laid on him the iniquity of us all. So at one point and at one time, God and Christ dealt with all sin, period. The totality of sin. He took away the sin of the world. He laid on him the iniquity of us all. He didn't mean all Jews. He meant all all men. He took on him the iniquity of us all. It's gone. God's not dealing with sin anymore. It's done. It's gone. It's been paid for. It's been taken away. Where there's, where, where remission of these is, there's no more offering for sin. Jesus is not being offered again and again and again and again. Verse 26, he says, For if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. There's not a reserve for if just in case he took away sin, he forgives sin, but then there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Mm -hmm. Now this is in no way of saying to try to preempt uh, an an error in thought. It's not not that we're saying that the the, the gift of Christ is just barely sufficient. Mm -hmm. It's not what I'm saying. The, The condition being addressed here is about people who were enlightened, and a taste of the heavenly gift from any partakers of the Holy Spirit, and then they go back to what they were saved from. Amen. That's the condition being addressed. In that case, there's no more sacrifice for sins. Verse 29. How much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. You're returning to the world a second time is trotting under the foot, underfoot the Son of God and putting him to an open shame. <clears throat> Here's another view of this. They crucified, they crucified to themselves the Son of God uh, afresh. Three, at least three times, I'm sure there's more, in the book of Acts, Peter uh, pegged the Jews with the guilt of Jesus' crucifixion. He wouldn't let it go. They, would, they brought it up again. You know, they they told, tell him to be quiet, and Peter, he would say, I, this Jesus whom ye slay, slew and hanged on a tree, him God highly exalted. He's, he's pinning them with the guilt, with their own guilt of they crucified Jesus. Whom you have crucified and slain. <clears throat> they, that day they cried, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate gave a word, remember that I find no, there's no cause of, of death in this man. And they cried out the louder, crucify him, crucify him. And Hebrews 6 is saying that these kind of people, they're crying that again. They crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh when someone having been saved out of the world return to those things. The fact is, brethren, I want to try to conclude these things. <clears throat> the fact is, everyone does something with Jesus. No one is exempt. God has exalted him. God has, has made him known. God has made him both Lord and Christ. Everybody does something with Jesus. Some people 
Some people follow him and won't turn away. They say, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of, of eternal life. Some, some even reject. They won't be released that they might obtain a better resurrection because they, they, they uh, consider the reproach of Christ greater riches than the, than the treasures of Egypt. But everybody's doing something with Jesus. Somebody, some people consider he's, this is, these, th these words are the words of a, of a demon-possessed man. That's, what they, that's how they assessed, assess Jesus. But on some, for some people, on their part, he's glorified. See, when they, they suffer wrongfully, they're suffering, they rejoice to be, that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Yep. See, so everybody, <laughs> no one can avoid this man. Mm -hmm. Everyone's going to do something with this man, this man Jesus. Everybody is responsible in some way. They're doing something with Jesus. So may it, never, may it not be true of us that we crucified him afresh and put him, to an, put him to an open shame. I'll leave you with this thought. When Jesus lived in the world as a man, being found in the fashion as a man, he was tempted at all points like as, like as we are. After those years of, of living, living before God, Jesus assessed, it, assessed his life this way. I have always do those things that please my Father. That was his assessment. When God looked at that same life and that, those same years, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's how God assessed it. So there's two assessments of Jesus' life. How do you assess it? See, that's, that's, what de that's what will determine the tenure of your life is how you assess Jesus. How do you, how do you value him? Uh, to you that believe, he's precious. Amen. And so I exhort you to walk in that way. Because it, no, the day of judgment, I thought about this when Brother Mike was uh, teaching this morning. On the day of judgment, Jesus will be no more precious than on that day. Yes, amen. Well, we want to find him precious now. Yeah. Amen. When you find him precious today, then you'll also find him precious yeah. on that day.